Man, you guys, uh, you guys look amazing. I'm so, uh, first of all, grateful to be here. And I'm grateful to Mikey and Flavia and the whole Flow kind of team for the platform. I think, you know, we ought to just take one second and look at everybody that's wearing a black shirt and think for one moment about um, what they've been doing over the last couple of weeks in order to create space for us to convene and talk and build and uh, create possibilities out of our industry. So I want to shout them out. Um, in thinking about how to leverage the platform to add value, right, to engage in an exchange with all you all, um, I thought I would just give you a little piece of fourth movement to start. It's something that we do before all of our meetings. We do it at board meetings. Uh, we do it on investor calls. And I'm going to ask you guys to participate with me. Are you guys open to that as a possibility? Yeah. All right. Um, so we always hold some spiritual space. We just take a moment to set an intention about a possibility for uh, what we're about to discuss or do. Make sure we're aligned with our why. Um, and so today, what I'd like us to do is just stand up. And I don't want us to do too much moving around, but if you're sitting next to somebody that you know already, either turn around or look in front of you, somebody that you don't already know. And I want to take a moment to just look in each other's eyes. And if you laugh, laugh. Give it um, about a minute of us just engaging. Can we do it? Just engaging, no talking, no talking, we're not talking, we're just looking. We're just looking and noticing, all right? We're just in each other's eyes for about a minute, and we're just looking and noticing. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So what I want to do today is really enroll you guys in the possibility of us all really being the same people, yeah. the same. Um, we're in an industry where 75% of all the ramifications of criminal justice have been suffered by people of color, and less than 1% of all of the opportunity is currently owned by people of color. Um, it's a $10 billion industry now. We know with what's happening across the country, it's soon to be 50. Shortly thereafter, it'll be a $100 billion industry. And I think what we have the opportunity to do through this new, burgeoning, beautiful business is create equitable existences in America. I think that's what social equity ought to be about. Uh, and that's what we do at Fourth Movement. So if I can, I think sometimes people are interested in exactly kind of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we got there. And I'll share a little bit about um, my story, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing. And then I'm going to end with um, showing you some social equity partners and the experience they're having and hopefully um, leave you inspired. Um, I'm a really fortunate guy. I'm from L.A., born and raised, went to school in Georgia, but was born... Um, to two amazing people. Uh, both parents grew up in South LA without a lot of resources, single parent household, um, my mom and my dad. And my old man in his 20s, uh, fresh out of the military, right place, right time, got a job at McDonald's. I think the things he learned from his great grandmother who was a domestic um, and the people whose homes that she cleaned and the lessons that he learned from them uh, really prepared him to be successful in corporate America. In about seven years, he became a corporate executive at McDonald's. And when I was 11 years old, he came in my room and he said, son, you know, you could never inherit my job, but one day you might be able to inherit my business. So at 11 years old, he bought two McDonald's restaurants in Pomona, California, and I grew up in and around that business. Uh, in my early 30s, I had an opportunity to do other things. I was approached to become a Buffalo Wild Wings franchisee, and so... You know, I'm, a, again, very fortunate guy. I own four of them with two of them under construction in and around Southern California. In 2011, I opened one in the Crenshaw District. It changed my life. Um, we're always, you know, good operators growing up in and around the business. Uh, my parents were very philanthropic, never saw them doing the wrong things, always doing the right things for the right reasons. 
But, you know, your parents say a lot of things you don't always really feel and connect to them. Like one day in, in Buffalo Wild Wings, which is a sports bar, um, the dean from Dorsey High School was there. It's a, my mother's alma mater. And it has a pretty bad reputation as an inner city high school that, you know, doesn't produce very good outcomes. And so I was pretty skeptical, pretty arrogant at the same time, talking about Dorsey High School. And um, the dean said, well, have you ever been? I said, no. She said, well, why don't you come? I said, sure, I'll go the next day. They have this very robust entrepreneurship program. And um, I saw the students, kind of fell in love on the spot, and agreed to teach a class. So I taught an entrepreneurial class for a semester. And at the end of that semester, the kids did a pop-up restaurant. It's kind of a big deal in the city. The mayor, et cetera, et cetera, came. Um, and it felt amazing. That led to me becoming a board chair at a local um, community college and then um, getting engaged with a program called Bloom. Similar to kind of what our social equity conundrum is around the country, in California, this is a stat that will surprise you, 40% of black boys don't graduate high school. 90% of the ones that do not graduate high school go to prison by 25. So whether you're blue or red, that's a burden on the taxpayer. But more importantly, it's really not fully expressing human capital, and we all lose. Right? I was able to really kind of see how little love it takes how little love it takes for people who I think have like lost the birth lottery through no fault of their own. They're born in the circumstances that produce these negative predictive outcomes. When you don't have a dad because he's in prison or he's dead, some of the ramifications of the war on drugs, when your mother has an issue with drugs and or any of the other various things, you know, you live in poverty and you can be African American in South LA you can be Latino in Houston or El Paso, or you can be white in Appalachia. America has a poor people problem. And poor people get poor people results in our country, and it's not loving existences. So we know that you can intervene. Uh, people want to be hopeful. What I believe is that a lot of people are born into situations where they really don't have a reason to believe that God loves them. And if they don't believe that God loves them, they don't have a reason to put it all on the line. Back in my business, I kind of saw that the same young people that we were helping to transform in South LA is really the same population that we employ as entry-level employers in Buffalo Wild Wings. It changed my perspective uh, from being a guy that sold chicken and beer in restaurants to being a guy that developed young people. And I think because of that approach, when the city of LA courageously decided that two-thirds of all of the licenses were going to go to people who have been disproportionately impacted by the application of criminal justice, one of our city council people called me and said, man, listen, these programs have happened in Oakland, um, and it's been pretty predatory. Would you take a look at getting involved? And so we did, and we stood up fourth movement. The model has changed as it does in all of your businesses it has over the last two years, but we're really happy with where we ended. In Los Angeles, um, we spoke to 700 people. We interviewed 350. We decided to train 120. Uh, 90 finished the program, and in the first part of phase three of the licensing, we secured 32 leases around the city of LA and applied on, all, on behalf of all 32 individuals whose lives have already changed. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, and so, and what I've seen in the model is, for, the first thing that we do is, in a year, we don't really talk very much about cannabis at all. We only talk about a way of being. Who do we have to be as individuals in order to do 200, 250 transactions a day? manage 15 or 20 other human beings, overcome our own traumas, deal with our own families, and be consistently doing what we know is the right thing to do, regardless of how we feel or what's expedient in the moment. We started by investing and in sending everybody to Landmark. Landmark Forum is something that I participated in, had a, a positive impact in my life. And for folks who uh, have experienced a lot of trauma, it created a tremendous clearing so we could speak the same language. What I'm trying to do here is, is, is give you guys some tools to think about in your business 
uh, and in your walk, what are things and ways that you can think about to engage in ways that make the world a more loving place for all of us through the people? Right? We'll spend a lot of time, and I'm not an expert. We've, we've listened to a lot of tremendous expertise around the plant, um, around the science, um, around what's coming, around the legislation. Right? But there's an opportunity here that's a human capital opportunity, and I'm hoping that when we leave today that you guys will be engaged in trying to figure out more ways that you could do something authentically and consistent with your business model to attach yourself to other human beings who will then go make the world a better place. Um, for Fourth Movement, what we know is that the model is transferable. So in addition to being in LA, we're in Chicago, we just announced the 50 people that we're training in Chicago. We think that the model is, um, you know, has, is viable all across the country, um, and we're going to do that. And then next year, we'll start standing up non-cannabis-related um, retail businesses so that people can own. We can address income inequality by not making people wrong for where they are, but surrounding them with all of the tools and access to resources to help them not compete in the marketplace, but to actually win. Yeah. So with that, without, rather than going into a long soliloquy about the rest of the different elements of our business, I think I would just leave you with the video. Um, and it's the video that really describes the moment where some very deserving people after the course of the year found out um, that they were selected to actually have a property and move forward with this process. If you get a store, you know, what would that mean for you? What will it mean to your family? And what will it mean to your community? It would mean a lot to me as a, a woman, a black woman, and as a social justice warrior. If I get a store, when I get a store, it's going to mean thriving, not surviving. It really becomes a platform for me to stand on to kind of pull everyone else up around me. It's be that thing that you know, people can rally around. To be able to change my family's life, to impact the communities that have been looked over and forgotten about is magical. It's about being successful and leaving a legacy for my mom, for my dad, for my brother, and for my community. I want to be an example like, yo, you know, you can actually do this as well. There's nothing that can make all of us happier than to present you with your store. I want to present you with your store. Oh, my God. Congratulations. No way. Like, is this real? <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to need to hug you guys. I'm afraid to look. <laughs> Really messing up my gangsta. Oh my God. <laughs> You're worthy, and um, we believe. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. <laughs>